award-winning novelist, literary and art critic, screenwriter, director and producer, raconteur, genius and a very nice man, teacher, playwright, wit and champion of the humble British calf, William Boyd remains too little known by the general public. His loyal readers were hooked when his first novel, A Good Man in Africa, won the Whitbread Award and Somerset Maugham Prize, and he is perhaps best known for his epic whole life story, the romantic drama Any Human Heart, which artfully weaves real life characters like Ian Fleming and the Duke of Windsor into an epic work of fiction, a device which has startled the literary world. It's called making things up, the author bashfully reflects. What's less well known is his attachment to film projects. Few realise he wrote the original screenplay of Richard Attenborough's Chaplin, where he befriended actor Robert Downey Jr. He was a writer of the BAFTA award-winning Channel 4 dramatisation of Any Human Heart and directed his own powerful art house war film, The Trench. A huge expert in modern art, he famously once invented the artist Nat Tate, in cahoots with David Bowie, as a joke on the art establishment. The accompanying autobiography exploited Will's love of found photographs, a fascination which has found its way into his innovative novel, Sweet Caress. This evokes his earlier epics, The New Confessions and Any Human Heart. Will is writing once again as a thoroughly believable female character. This followed an invitation by the Fleming Foundation to write the best of all Bond novels solo, arguably including those written by Fleming himself, which features his recipe for vinaigrette, a recipe which has eight-year-old children begging for more salad. His father, Dr Alexander Boyd, practising at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, became the role model for the Doctor in Will's debut novel, A Good Man in Africa, a novel which he sold to publisher Hamish Hamilton before he'd actually written a word of it. There followed two weeks of frantic activity passed off as rewrites before the book was delivered. In 2018, we talked to the author more about his experiences as a novelist and screenwriter. My breakfast was extremely unexciting this morning. I had half a banana and a slice of toast with marmalade and a cup of tea, no milk, no sugar. My father was um, quite uh, communicative about his various strange medical problems that he encountered, but I, I was incredibly squeamish, so I never asked him uh, any questions. The house was full of medical textbooks, and as an, as an adolescent boy, of course, you might be flicking through these, educating yourself, and I never did because the images in them were so horrible. Um, so I think there's a, an element of uh, my father um, in the various doctors I've had in my fictions. But he died um, young. He was only 58 when he died, and I was in my mid-20s, and so he it's his, his ghost, if you like, his shade that's influenced me rather than anything I actually picked up at the time. A fridge is an amazingly efficient place to store anything precious. Um, apparently at Hiroshima they found this blackened, uh, scorched fridge and they opened it up and they found six eggs inside. Hence the idea that if you want to store something in that in your house burns down, the fridge is the best place. But I, I don't keep stuff in the fridge anymore because I've got a computer. <laughs> and uh, this is the pre-computer age we're talking about when, because I, I write in longhand, um, for a while there was only one copy of the novel I was writing. Um, but now I, every day or every second day, I type it up onto a computer it's saved umpteen times, so I'm, I'm more relaxed. The period of, um, I call it the period of invention, uh, followed by a period of composition. And I do write a, a tremendous amount, actually. I, I fill notebooks. Um, I make all my mistakes uh, in that period before I've started actually writing the novel. 
And the aim of this, you know, two years or so of, of thinking and sometimes traveling, of accumulating a library that would be useful for me, of collecting photographs, et cetera, et cetera, is really all aiming towards establishing the ending of the novel, um, the destination. And once I, once I know how the novel ends, then I can start writing it. Uh, and it's very good advice. I give it all the time. It's often ignored. But um, um, a, a good ending can save a mediocre novel, and a, a bad ending can, can ruin a good novel. So when people say to me, I've got a great idea for a novel, or a film, or a television series, or whatever, I always say, how does it end? And invariably they say, well, I haven't thought of that yet. And my advice is, think of the ending and work back, and you might be OK. So that's what I do in this long period of gestating. Um, I, I uh, research, um, I make notes, I can do a very detailed chapter list. Um, I ba basically can write an, a sort of outline of the novel that I'm hoping that the, the end will come to me. And once that's there, then I can start. Screenplays take much less time than a novel. Um, how long is a screenplay? 100 pages on average, uh, lots of blank spaces, um, probably a chapter of a novel in terms of actual words written down. Of course, it's, uh, you're telling a story and there's a, a narrative there, but um, it takes me roughly three years to invent and write a novel. But uh, I have written a script in a week. <laughs> um, so it's a different, I've always said this, is a totally different art form and its demands are, are, are different and the time spent on it uh, can be long if you're in, in writing an original script, you have to research it, a bit like writing a novel. But what takes the time is the development and the endless notes you get from executives uh, that you have to somehow incorporate in your various drafts. And so a, a screenplay can take longer than a novel, paradoxically, before it gets made. Um, but you're not working on it in the same way. It's a, it's a different, it's a craft, I think, not an art. I think that um, people are opaque and mysterious. And um, one of the great powers of the novel is that it actually explains other people to us better than our own life experiences do. If you want to know what makes people tick, re read a novel. And actually, all the ambiguities and uh, uncertainties of human behavior are kind of resolved in a novel because, paradoxically, they're all true because somebody made them up and can vouch for them. So I think that these ideas of different identities of, of people occupying different selves, which I happen to believe anyway. I don't think we're the same person all the way through our life. I think we do change and our, our experiences, good and bad, um, make us a d different people, um, are, are a result of my life experiences. But um, in, in the fictional experience, I can nail them down much more effectively. When it comes to book jackets, um, I, because I f fancy that, uh, or I pride myself on having some ideas about is aesthetics and, and design, uh, unlike many novelists, um, covers are very important to me. And I couldn't um, actually tolerate a novel of mine if I didn't like the cover. And um, I, in my contracts, I have a veto. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to make sure the covers work. And one of, the, one of the things I obsess about is typeface. Um, um, the other thing is that uh, if you put a character's, a person's face on the cover of the book, the reader automatically will identify that face with the character in the novel. So I've always insisted that the face is cropped or, or shadowed in some way so that you can't make that easy identification. You can't say, oh, this young woman on the cover of Braswell Beach must be Hope Clearwater. Uh, I like to keep that, I like to let the reader, you know, contribute his or her um, uh, understanding of the character 
because it is a, a joint effort, a novel, um, a uniquely, um, a unique relationship. And so the, the reader doesn't want to know that uh, John James Todd or Logan Mount Stewart looks like the photograph of that guy on the cover. So I, that's, that's another one of my bugbears, and uh, so far so good. I don't think anyone's ever been identified yet. I've just seen the cover for, my, for the new novel, the, pen, the paperback cover, and one of them has a picture of a young woman. It's a fantastic picture, but I said, look, everyone will think that's Lika Bloom. Um, and so the, I think we're going to go with a cropped face again, um, just so you can't make that identification. Chimpanzees uh, were believed to be benign, um, happy primates. And the, the th one of the things that stimulated Brazville Beach was this discovery that uh, by Jane Goodall, who was one of the, m the most famous uh, primatologist, that in fact chimpanzees committed genocide on other chimpanzee tribes and not only wiped them out, but wiped them out with gratuitous cruelty. And what it showed me was actually that chimps are incredibly close to human beings when it comes to evil and violence. Um, I, think, I think the interesting thing about the novel and cinema is that every cinematic technique that we take for granted today was actually present in the novel before cinema was invented. So extreme close-ups, parallel action, slow motion, cross-cutting, um, it was all there in Madame Bovary, for example, and the Lumiere brothers hadn't yet arrived on the scene. So in fact, the techniques of the novel influence cinema far more than vice versa. And I think the novel has always been very visual anyway. Um, people say, sometimes say to me, oh, your novel's very cinematic, but I say, no, they're very novelistic. Um, and so if there's been any influence at all on my screenwriting, it's come from my novel writing, because again, they're two vastly different art forms, and the novel offers you unlimited generous freedom, and film offers you a world of compromise and parameters because it's photography. It sounds banal, but it's, it's, it's what determines you can do, whereas in a novel you can do absolutely anything. And Brazzaville Beach, with its two timescales, I change pronouns uh, from I to she. Um, there's a kind of editorial presence of somebody commenting about maths on the action. Just an example of the, the novel's total freedom to fracture narrative, to play around with structure. You couldn't film Brazzaville Beach in the way I've written it. Um, Pedro Almodovar actually wanted to make a film of Brazzaville Beach, believe it or not. Um, but it would have been a far simpler story. Uh, and all the complexities and the freedoms of the novel just, just couldn't have been in the film. Well, photographs have been used in novels for quite a long time. I mean, Virginia Woolf used photographs in a novel, for example. Um, and W.G. Sebalt, for example, more recently has made a point of using photographs in a novel, but they've only used you know, eight or ten. I, I had 73 photographs in Sweet Caress, which I think is a record. and. Uh, I was astonished that people took it for granted, as if it was the most normal thing in the world. And they were all anonymous photographs, and um, some of them were of people who were in the novel, but some of them were also examples of photographs that I said Amory had taken. Um, and it was all an, uh, an attempt to make the novel seem so real that you would doubt its fictionality, another thing that I constantly do. And of course, I had used photographs in Nat Tate as well. So it was, uh, it was taking the, the Nat Tate experiment uh, to another degree. Um, but it's, it's funny, um, readers just don't, co readers don't comment it on, on it, not, and critics didn't really comment on it either. So um, maybe it, it wasn't as innovative as I thought it was. 
I'm about to draw a new Nat Tate as a wedding present for our niece. Um, occasionally, uh, somebody moves house or a godchild gets married and I find another Nat Tate in, in the attic. Um, I think I've done about over 20 Nat Tates now over the years. Um, and I keep a record of who has them because um, I think so, a couple of instances where I think people have tried to forge them. But I know exactly who has the Nat Tates, and, I, and on the back of every Nat Tate I do, there is a letter of authentication signed by me. So it would be very easy if somebody you know, rocked up to Christie's or Sotheby's saying, I've got a Nat Tate. I could very easily verify if it was a, a fraud of the real thing. So. Um, I, yes, I will, I, do, I will carry on producing the odd Nat Tate from time to time, and um, I have five, actually, at home, hanging in the hall. Um, so uh, there's, qu there's quite a body of work now. Well, I think the idea of pursuit is, is actually very common in novels, and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful motor, if you like, for the narrative, a, a chase or, or somebody fleeing. I think in, in my case it's slightly more complicated than that because another thing I, I, I realized looking back is that I, I often take a character from somewhere quite secure or somewhere they're familiar with and plonk them down somewhere they're unfamiliar with and therefore they, have to be, they become tested, they have to fall back on their own resources as individuals. Um, and I do it time and again. Um, even. Uh, a novel like um, Stars and Bars, for example, ends with the character Henderson Dawes being pursued by a crazed um, redneck gunman. So it's, uh, I think that almost implies what happens next, but it's more a question of removing the character from his or her comfort zone and seeing how they cope. Um, and, you know, a pursuit or jeopardy or flight, in a way, allows me to do that very easily. Um, but it's all, I mean, in, in the new novel, uh, Love is Blind, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very common trope in Scottish literature, the, the demonic pursuit. Uh, if you think of um, the famous novel, Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg, there's a, 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 a brother figure who's pursuing the, the central character. Um, so I wanted to nod to these traditions as well, but I, I recognize that I do it all the time. But it's more to, as I say, it's more to put my characters under stress and see how they behave. Well, I think I, I move between the recent past and the present. Um, I've written quite a f few short stories that are set in the present, for example, the whole the Bethany Melmoth stories are all about a young girl in London today. So I think there's a, a lot of present day in my fiction. The problem with writing something that's absolutely contemporary is it has a built-in obsolescence and it can very quickly date, you know, who won Strictly Come Dancing last year, you know. Um, it's, uh, I sort of, uh, I rather disparagingly call it Mars Bar School of Writing because you put in the references that seem to you to be entirely recognizable and commonplace, but in 10 years' time, you'll need a footnote to explain them. So in fact, it's, it's more common and it's more natural for novelists to write slightly in the past because everything is fixed there, the types of cars, the, the movies you saw, the clothes you wear, wore, the f food you ate is fixed, um, and politicians and political events and historical events have you know, had all their ramifications explored. If you set something absolutely today, you may find yourself with egg all over your face when you know, Brexit is reversed, for example. Um, but uh, so I think, you know, you look at great, great novels, you know, George Eliot wrote Middlemarch. It's, it was set 30 years before she wrote it. You know, James Joyce wrote Ulysses in the 1920s. It's set in the very beginning of the 20th century. It's quite common for novelists to go a decade or two back. And I think that also for me, the, the 20th century, I was born in the middle of the 20th century. You know, my grandmother was born in the late 1880s. 
So I knew somebody very well who was born in the 19th century and who was a Victorian. So it doesn't seem to me to be ancient history. I mean, if I wrote a novel set in the 16th century, that would be another matter. But writing a novel that goes, say, three generations back doesn't seem to me to be that odd. I mean, my, uh, my great uncle was wounded at the Battle of the Somme. Um, my grandfather was wounded at the Battle of Passchendaele. Um, my grandmother and my grandfather went on their honeymoon to um, Brussels in 1895 or something. Like that. So that's when um, Love is Blind starts, um, 1894, in fact. So I knew people who were alive then. So it seems to me to be part of the present, in a way. Um, and I don't have any problem about, about that. But technically speaking, it's uh, advantageous to go just a little bit back in time and you save yourself a lot of hassle. The piece of music in Love is Blind is a Scottish folk song. Um, I, I've, I sort of know what the, the tune is because I was thinking of a, a, a piece of bluegrass music that I love, which was sung by Alison Krauss, a wonderful bluegrass singer, loosely based, or the lyrics of which were loosely based on uh, a poem that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote. But the words of the, of the folk song that I quote in the, in the novel were made up by me, as, as my, my verses. But I haven't really got a tune playing in my head, to be honest. Names are incredibly important, and I think that as a tip, again, I offer this advice to younger writers, um, you shouldn't call your character, you know, Sally Brown or Martin Foster because perfectly good names though they are, because they're not sort of living or, or, or vivid in any way. So I always think you should give your characters names with a little bit of edge. You don't need to go the full Dickensian route, uh, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle or whatever, but if you give your characters a slightly odd name, they're already living and breathing on the page, I think. And that includes very minor characters, people who just you know, walk on and walk off. So I collect names and I take great care to name every character in a way that is somehow individual. Um, John Todd is a rather boring name, but if he's called John James Todd, suddenly you remember his name. Um, and I think it's true of, uh, of all the characters I've used, with the exception of James Bond, very boring name, um, I, I, I think a lot about wh how to christen them. And this includes characters who are foreign, whether they're German or uh, French or Italian or whatever. I try to get an interesting Italian name or an interesting French name as well. And um, I think it's, it makes them come alive. Um, and uh, I think I will never change that particular practice. It's, uh, it's a very, very good tip, I think. I've got uh, masses of names. Um, I write them down. Uh, uh, I was writing down names the other day that come from medieval professions, like, you know, Cordwainer and Fletcher and Thatcher and because people were called after the job they used to do. And, um, and some of them are, are very odd names, but they're actually very historically right for a certain type of English person. Um, so I, uh, I you know, just jot them down in my notebook and uh, save them for, for the next novel. And, um, but it's very important, I think. And if I, didn't, if I didn't like the name of my central character, I don't think I could write the novel happily. You know, I'm often criticized, or critics often say, you know, what odd names. But usually these critics have very odd names themselves. And um, I think if you're in a world where somebody called Henry Dent Brocklehurst can marry a woman called Lily Maltese, and they're real people, you know, I haven't even come close to that. So I, I, I won't apologize for one second uh, for my naming. Chaplin was a complicated film because uh, I was the, the first writer of the film was Brian Forbes, um, who I became very fond of and close to. But Forbes's script was not accepted by the studio. 
which was Universal in Hollywood. And so Universal said to Dickie Attenborough, you have to start again. And that's when I was approached. And so I, re I didn't rewrite Brian Forbes' script. His script was never used. It was, um, and so I wrote a new script of Chaplin um, for Dickie Attenborough to shoot. And it was a very expensive film uh, for, for its time. It was the mid-90s. It was a $45 million film, so, I don't know, $150 million today. Um, and uh, the Universal, we were on the point of starting to film it. Um, Robert Downey had been cast, um, and then Universal pulled out. They said it was too expensive. Um, and so this happens all the time in the film industry. Um, but only Dickie Attenborough could have set it up again. And he did set it up again at another studio, a mini major called Carol Co. And the executives at Carol Co, in their wisdom, decided that Chaplin's later years should be addressed. Because I stopped the film, I think, in 1958 when he was kicked out of America and he wasn't allowed back in. That seemed to me a very good end. But they wanted his Switzerland years addressed. And so. By then, my contract with, being with Universal had run out, and so Dickey approached William Goldman, who he'd worked with before, paid him to write the Switzerland scenes. The writer, and I would say this, wouldn't I, is actually the most important person in a film, let's say, slicing up the cake, at least 60% of the film is the writer. Maybe the actors, 20, the directors, uh, you know, has its, has his or her portion, but um, Hollywood has has tried to tame writers' power by setting one against the other, and the whole process of rewriting is a way of, of diluting the power of the writer. Um, luckily, Chaplin wasn't too diluted, I think, by, by Goldman's scenes. I mean, he was just hired to do a job, and he did it, but it was the studio who demanded these scenes, and they were shot and put in the film. And I think the film actually um, stands on its own two feet um, and is a very, sounds like faint praise, but it's not a very interesting film and probably the most daring film that Dickie Attenborough made in his career. Um, very unusual for him to make a film about somebody he revered but who had, you know, very obvious feet of clay. The Trench is um, an interesting film, and in a way, as time goes by, it becomes more interesting. I wanted to make a film about the First World War, which obsessed me, uh, obsesses me, and I wanted it to be super accurate. Um, and uh, we took enormous pains to get everything right, uh, from the you know the badges on the on the caps to the state of the trenches and. July 1916, everything was scrupulously accurate. And one of the things I wanted to do was to have no stars in the film. And I achieved that. The only thing that's happened is that they've since become enormous stars. But actually, at the time, when I cast Daniel Craig, he wasn't well known at all. Um, ben Wishaw, it was his very first film. He was doing his A-levels. Um, Killian Murphy, I think, had made one little film in Ireland. Danny Dyer uh, had yet to um, take over the pub in East Enders. Um, Julian Ryan Tut, James Darcy, um, all these guys have gone on to have fantastic careers, and they owe it all to me, of course. Um, but they were unknowns at the time. And the most famous actor in it was Paul Nichols, who had just come out of East Enders. Um, but, um, and that, that slightly worried me, but because I didn't watch EastEnders, I didn't know how famous he was. Um, but they were all unknowns at the time. So when you saw the film, when it was released in 1999, none of those faces would make you say, oh gosh, he's the guy in X or Y. Um, but the film has, has a kind of slightly mythic status because all these people were in it when they were starting out or at the very beginnings of their career and uh, are now, you know, stellar, um, shining bright um, film stars. But the film was, you know, it cost a million pounds. It was an art house war movie. Um, it was a fascinating experience for me to do. It got a release in the UK, it got released 
uh, you know, art house release in America. Um, it, it played in you know European. I went to film festivals with it. Um, you can still buy it on DVD. Um, Twenty years later, uh, it has a DVD life. So, uh, knowing the nature of the business, for me, it was actually quite successful. Um, nobody got rich, um, but the film is still out there, and every now and then it pops up on television, and so it, it has a life, and that's the thing that, um, in a way, as a novelist, troubles me slightly about television and film, is that sometimes it can seem ephemeral. If you missed it on the night, it's gone forever, and somehow you want you, the films you've written to have the same kind of longevity as the books you've written, but it's not that easy. But so I look back at the trench, and I'm still very friendly with the cast. Uh, was, it, I learned a tremendous amount. Um, I think it's a it's a, a good film. There are things I do differently now, but as a portrait of the reality of trench life in World War One, which was in a way my main ambition. I don't think it can be faulted. Filmmakers, um, it's very hard to say because I think uh, I'm, I'm not really a, a believer in the auteur theory because I've worked on films so much and it is a true collaboration. And I don't think anybody even the writer should have their name, as, in, as it's called, the possessory credit, a film by, you know. Um, and so there are some films that I love because of the acting, and there are some films I love because of the directing, there are some films I love because of the writing. Um, and there are films that f somehow um, worm their way into your subconscious uh, for reasons you can't really explain. Quentin Tarantino calls them hangout films. You think, what should we watch? And you think, well, let's watch that one again. You know, you can't understand. But I think that, um, you know, one of my favorite films of you know, top 10, top five is Chinatown, for example. Now, that's not because of Roman Polanski's direction, but it may be because of the incandescent beauty of Faye Dunaway, um, who never been better, I think. Um, or it may be because it's an original screenplay, it's not an adaptation, and it's written by Robert Town, and it's, it's a, you know, of all the screenplays uh, that have been written, uh, Roman Polanski, you know, really did uh, Robert Town proud with that adaptation, except he changed the ending. Um, and um, Polanski and Bob Evans, who was the executive at Paramount when they made it, thought Robert Town's ending was wrong. And he didn't agree with them, but they overruled him. And the ending of Chinatown, now, which we have now, um, is actually Polanski and Bob Evans's idea. And actually, it's fantastically good. It, you, Robert, I've seen Robert Town's original screenplay, and his ending is um, too sentimental, uh, and Polanski and Bob Evans's ending is utterly bleak, and of course it fits the story so well. So who gets the, the slice, biggest slice of the cake there? I don't know. It's um, so. Uh, um, f for me, it's um, there are all sorts of filmmakers I I like, um, and but they're in all different categories. Um, for example the film of the spy who came in from the cold um, is a, a very sort of doggedly faithful adaptation of the book um, directed you know with competence but it's Richard Burton who makes that film absolutely live on in your memory it's an absolutely sensational performance and so is it because there is Richard Burton in the way the key creative force in that film rather than Le Carre, the original writer, or I can't remember who wrote the screenplay, or the, or the director. So it's, it's, it's again and again you realize that film is uh, the work of many hands. Um, my, I had a great friend called Jim Clark, who's a film editor, um, known as Dr. Clark, because he could make sick films well again. 
Um, and he worked a lot with John Schlesinger, who I also knew, and knew John. And John had just finished shooting Midnight Cowboy, and it was a complete and utter mess. Um, and he rang Jim and said, can you come into the editing suite in New York, or wherever he was cutting it, and, say, and see if you can fix my film? And Jim did, and John won an Oscar, and so did Dustin Hoffman. Um, and Jim's credit on the film is creative consultant. It's not even credited as a film editor. But he recut the film. He added the Harry Nielsen song, Everybody's Talking. You know, you can't think of Midnight Cowboy without that music. So, you know, who is the, who's the creative power in that film? And this is the editor in this case, not the, not the director, but fantastic performances from Hoffman and John Voight, of course. So I, I think uh, the possessory credit is iniquitous. Um, everybody deserves the credit they have, whether they're actors, directors, writers, editors, art directors, composers. It, it, it is a curious alchemy uh, that goes to making a film work. And um, I don't think anyone should claim you know, the, the, the top role in that. It's, uh, it can be very subtle and often the person who seems to have the least credit on the film is the one who deserves the most. Television is in a very good state, I think, uh, because all the good work is being done in television. Um, it's one of these um, step changes, um, paradigm shifts that's going on in that there are two types of films, enormously bloated um, $350 million films and little art house um, films at the other end that cost $5 million. And, and in between, all the films that used to fill in that gap are now on television, it seems to me. And I would say that 70% um, of the work I'm offered now, uh, commissioned work, is, is television. And it's far more interesting than the work I would be offered in the movie business. There is a, a problem in that there, is, uh, there are these giant beasts out there, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Google, you know, all wanting to make product, as they call it. And you just can't watch it all. Um, it's, it's just, in a way, too much good drama out there. Um, and um, I was just talking to a film critic to, earlier today, and he thinks it's all going to turn sour because the more money that's pumped into long-form television, the blander it will become. And what is risky and edgy now and what you can get away with because these giant corporations will be paying for it will start to... Um, take everything that's edgy out and make some sort of bland pabulum to serve up to the, the, the viewing population. Who knows? It's definitely a time of change. It's probably never been better for filmmakers. Um, and there's a lot of work out there. And you're given quite a lot, much more freedom than you are, as, uh, than you are in the movie business. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a boom time, but we all know booms end and then there's bust. Uh, so we'll see. Um, but certainly in my, in my experience, the, in, the recent, in recent years, um, I have done, do, done all my work for um, these uh, streaming services or foreign television companies, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not working for the the networks anymore, BBC, ITV, Channel 4. I'm working with Amazon and ZDF in Germany and E1, other companies like that. So as a writer, in writing film, writing television, or television drama, it's a, a really good time to be uh, around because the jobs I'm doing are really interesting and challenging, some of them adaptations of my own novels. Um, but they have to be made at the end of the day, and uh, that's another issue. But um, it's certainly a, a good time to be uh, in the f creative end of the filmmaking process, I think.
Well, every writer has, or every screenwriter has this kind of parallel universe where the, 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 their much loved and nurtured projects actually got made and, and, and were realized. But it's a very f fickle business, and I have a, 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 at least three or four uh, projects that I wish had been made and I thought would, as I think would have been good, but you know, economic circumstances or personnel changes made it impossible. Um, I'm lucky in the sense that <coughs> uh, I, I, it's not the only thing I do, so I can recycle all this material one way or another with a bit of luck. Um, but there are, you know, I've probably written 70 or 80 screenplays uh, over the year, you know, over 30 odd years. And I've had, you know, 18 made, you know, um, some of them short films as well. So that's quite a good hit rate in the, in the business. Um, and, uh, but I, there, there are two or three that got away that I would have loved to have seen. Um, some of them are um, a bit moribund, um, others are showing more signs of life. And I think the two in particular that um, may actually be made uh, early next year, one is a, based on one of my short stories called Cork, which is a little art house film, which we'll film in, in and around Lisbon, um, and set in the 1930s of a very, very strange love affair. And the other one is an original script, uh, a series of scripts of six hours of television called Spy City, which is set in Berlin in 1961, in the months before the Berlin Wall goes up, when Berlin was an open city to a degree, had four armies in it, Russian, French, British, and American, and of course, hoaching with spies, hence the title. And so I've come up with uh, a, a spy thriller um, that is to do with the B Berlin Wall and to do with the, that kind of, it was the focal point of the Cold War at the time. And there was a fear that World War III would start because of Berlin, in fact. So it's a very interesting Cold War spy thriller. And um, that's all written. We're beginning to cast it, we're looking for our British spy. And I think, you know, knock on wood, uh, we'll film it in Prague next year. Um, so those, those are the two hottest ones, but uh, there are any number of other projects, including an eight-hour version of The Blue Afternoon, um, which is you know, in development, lots of things in development. But, the, but Cork and Spy City, I hope, will be the next things that are made.